Welcome to the 115th anniversary of what is now the Greater Taylorville Chamber of Commerce and the 70th anniversary of WTIM. What is now the Chamber was organized April 22, 1907. C.M. Parker was elected the first president and Robert Carlin was elected the first secretary. Thousands of committed people have served on the Chamber Board over its 115 years to continue providing a gateway for business and community information. We congratulate the Greater Taylorville Chamber for their 115 years of service. It was August 8, 1950. Russell Armitrout and Roger Moyer, who were involved in filing for several AM radio stations across Illinois, filed with the Federal Communications Commission to build a 1,000-watt daytime AM radio station at 1410 on the dial at Taylorville, Illinois. The FCC authorized the construction permit to Armand Trout and Moyer on August 1, 1951, with call letters applied for as WTIN. Stories vary as to how those call letters were selected, but the one we've heard most is that they stood for Taylorville, Illinois Midlands to honor the town and the Midland area of Christian County. Studios and the two towers were built just north of Taylorville past Cherokee Street and what is now bypassed Route 48. It was built in a bottom area, meaning it was susceptible to flooding. But with AM radio coverage based on the conductivity of the ground, the wetter the area around the towers, the further the signal would go. So it was an ideal location when it didn't flood. WTIM 1410 AM signed on for the first time on January 20th, 1952 at four in the afternoon. The Taylorville High School band was set up in the West Gym at Taylorville High School with a live feed via telephone line connecting the gym to the WTIM studios. Retired attorney Vance Fraley was in that band and recalls playing the national anthem to kick off WTIM that afternoon. Yeah, I was a senior that year at high school and a member of the band. And we were asked to, well, there was going to be an assembly in the big gym, and uh, we were asked to play the Star Spangled Banner, I remember, and so that was how we got uh, the whole thing started, and that's the first time they went on the air. So if I remember right, the uh, mayor of the city was there, and also a lot of business people, and of course the Mr. and Mrs. Moyer, who owned the radio station were there, and I, I assume there are a lot of other people, but I don't remember who all was there. WTIM received the okay from the FCC to broadcast during daytime hours with a daily sign-off at 6 p.m. from the day it went on the air. The station went through a host of ownership changes pretty much from the day it went on the air, with Russell Armantrout selling his ownership and Roger Moyer's brother Keith getting involved. Keith would later build a TV station in Jacksonville in the late 1960s. WTIM was involved in serving Taylorville, Christian County, and Central Illinois from the day it went on the air. It invited the community to be on the air as part of its programming, covering local news, interviews, events, and even had children and youth on the air. Johnny Paola, whose real name is John Mazzotti, was a popular disc jockey on WTIM in the 1960s. His daughter, Lori Hart, provided us some written memories of what it was like for her father to be on the radio. I know it shaped a lot of his life. Broadcasting was his love. There are still a lot of people that comment to me that they just loved listening to him. He used to drive by the old location that was torn down and say, Daddy used to work there every time we drove by. Before my teenage years, he'd show me the old photos of broadcasting and spin records for me at home. Those were such great times. He did go on to broadcast with some other stations, and later he did television for the Jerry Lewis Muscular Dystrophy Telethon. I only assumed that the salary for a small market broadcaster was not enough for the family, with mom staying at home with us, because nothing else would have made him leave radio but to care for his family. He eventually went to work for the state of Illinois for the Secretary of State, although he would do DJ services for some birthday parties and his class reunions. 
He would do Elvis and everyone loved it. He really knew how to put on a show and loved to dance. Even my friends and my sister's friends all enjoyed time around him too. I think all of this came from his time at WTIM. The broadcasting and music inspired him. It was in his blood. After he died, several in the broadcast industry reached out to me and told me how much they admired my father and that dad's touch was on everything they heard and saw at WTIM during and after he left. In the 1950s and 60s, it was common for an owner of a small market AM radio station to file the build and operate a second station on a totally new band, FM. Ownership filed with the FCC to build WTIM FM 92.7 on September 28, 1967. The FCC granted their application February 7, 1968. The station played beautiful music from 6 a.m. till 11 p.m., with the biggest benefit being it could broadcast Taylorville sports at night. Games were being heard on a delay basis on WTIM AN 1410 since it was a daytime AM radio station. On January 29, 1969, application was made to the FCC to move WTIM AM and FM studios from its tower site on the Cherokee Street extension south of Taylorville to studios inside the Fresquina Motor Hotel at 117 East Market. The FCC granted permission for the studio move on July 31, 1969. Former Taylorville attorney Vance Fraley, who was in the high school band playing the national anthem the day WTIM went on the air January 20, 1952, later became part owner of WTIM in the 1960s. Fraley talks about his years in ownership. Through uh, the Qantas organization, which I was a member of, I knew a man named uh, Don Jones from uh, Litchfield, and he came to Taylorville and asked me if I would represent him in trying to buy WTIM. And I think that was probably 1969, I think. And uh, that's where we started. And then with John, Don's leading us on, uh, we ended up acquiring, I think, the total of 11 stations at one time. John O. Well, he was a good friend of ours because he, uh, he was a neighbor of mine and I've known John for years and his family. And uh, he was always involved in youth activities. He was involved with uh, sports and did a lot of announcing. And uh, I think he bought all the uh, weightlifting equipment for the high school, if I remember right. He was, he was a wonderful person and uh, it was very involved in community activities, yes. What are a few things that has been able to keep, in your estimation, because you, you're a former station owner yourself, been able to keep WTIM on the air for 70 years? Well, I, I think with them being local, uh, they cover what's happening in the community. They also get involved in the community with the various activities, and they always have been. So uh, uh, I think it's been a very big asset for Taylorville, really. Doug Quick, longtime news and weather anchor for WICD-TV Channel 15 in Champaign, grew up in Taylorville and started his career as an announcer on WTIM, AM, and FM. Well, the first time I actually applied for a job at WTIM, it was owned and run by Don Jones and uh, an operations guy, his name was Ron Billiter, if I remember that correctly. And uh, I applied, I was a senior in high school and I think it was in March because I remember there was snow and things were melting and, and thawing out and it was a nice day and I was scared to death. And I, I went there, he gave me some, some AP copy to read in the studio and I was terrified. I was scared to death. It's just, I wanted to do this, but it was, it. I was real nervous about it, uh, to say the least. I think I probably sweated out about three gallons of sweat during that, uh, during that interview, but I didn't get the job then. So that was in 1972. In 
1973, uh, when I was going to Lincoln Land Community College, I just stopped in at WTAX and DBR and uh, Shelby Harbison, who owned the station, and I had the opportunity to talk to him and he spent a good hour with me. I mean, I was blown away with that. And then one of the jocks that was there that I really liked, and he was a mentor, and later in life, I ended up working with him. His name was Bob Taylor, and he showed me the automation system. And I was intrigued by that. And I knew that WTIM and TIM-FM were operating on an automation system at that time. It wasn't quite as sophisticated, but it did the job. And then later in 1974, in the spring there, I, I approached John Alls because he was in charge at that particular time. And I told him, I said, you know, you got a real problem here because you're not reaching the younger people at all with these radio stations. You know, they're listening to St. Louis and Chicago and even Springfield, and they're not listening to, the, to this station at all. It has no respect. And, and I said, have you ever thought about putting um, a, a rock show on in the evening, block programming, WTIM FM, which was a beautiful music station. So you'd go to Montevani and the next thing you know, you're playing, you know, who knows what, uh, some, some rock band, you're, you're playing Grand Funk Railroad. So it, 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 it was quite a change, but at seven o'clock and, and he, he actually agreed to it. I think it took him a while to think about it, but he needed an operator there at night anyway. So, you know, what the heck? So he, he hired me. The station had zilch for a library even from the days of the early or the late 60s well mid to late 60s when when uh, john mazzotti johnny paola was 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 playing rock and roll in the afternoon that music library was really picked over and not much was left i i scavengered what i could out of the old 45s and there were some albums uh, that I went through that the station received, and they never threw anything away. I mean, it, it, it was a hoard of record albums. And I found some real jewels in there that, that I ended up playing that actually became hits. Uh, I was probably the first person on the planet to play Lady by Styx, and which later became a big hit. But I happened to find it uh, on, a, on, on a, a, a promotional single and played that Barry Manilow and uh, his his first uh, uh, hit Mandy. I, I played that six months before it actually became a hit. So I found a lot of stuff, and and I played it in the evening from seven to eleven every night, Monday through Saturday. And I'll tell you what, uh, one thing it did do. I had no social life whatsoever with those hours. It was tough when you only got Sunday night off. It's, it's kind of difficult to make contact with other people out there. But I, I did have some, you know, radio groupies that would come in and visit me at night and they'd bring me records, actually. And a lot of the stuff came from my own collection that that set in crates and, you know, back in the production studio. And I played a lot of stuff in my own collection. And then later, John arranged for a trade with a, a record store in Springfield and I'd go up once a week. and you know, get, uh, you know, 10 or 12 45s that I needed. And, and so that, that worked out pretty well. And since I was in Springfield anyway, it worked out. So, uh, it, it was, uh, it was a real challenge to put that show on the air, but we did it and I have recordings of it and I'd never play for anybody. I think it's important that we do what we can to represent the community because if, if I am not familiar with the community, what I would do would be turn on the local radio station, find it somewhere. And that should be a reflection of what that local community is. WTIM continued to serve the community on both 1410 AM and 92.7 FM into the 1970s. Station ownership filed with the FCC to give WTIM AM 1410 a nighttime signal on June 29, 1976 with the same daytime power of 1,000 watts and adding three more towers to further directionalize the signal, preventing it from interfering with other stations operating at night on 1410. The application to give WTIM a full-time signal by adding nighttime coverage had a petition to deny filed by Great Trails Broadcasting Corporation on September 15, 1978. 
claiming WTIM's proposed nighttime signal would interfere with their station, WING Dayton, Ohio. WTIM ownership has to file paperwork to fight off the Great Trails petition and had to redo the WTIM nighttime application, reducing nighttime power from 1,000 to 500 watts. After revising their application, the FCC granted WTIM AM 1410's nighttime signal and its ability to be on the air 24 hours a day on October 9, 1979. About the time WTIM AM 14 was granted the ability to be on the air 24 hours a day, the economy nationwide and in the local area took a turn for the worse. Inflation was out of control. A new Federal Reserve chief hiked interest rates were borrowing money to build the nighttime signal, which in 1979 dollars cost over $100,000, was not practical. After filing for several extensions to keep the FCC construction permit in force, WTIM's owners couldn't justify building the nighttime signal, and the construction permit was ultimately canceled in the early 1980s. The late John Oltz led WTIM through a lot of growth in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He built WTIM FM 92.7 in 1968, moved WTIM AM and FM studios to the Forkizna Motor Hotel in 1969, and later filed for the WTIM AM 1410 nighttime signal in 1976. Alts headed several different corporations that owned the stations from 1968 through 1983. Another local owner of WTIM and what became WEEE was Marsha Linton Farr, who purchased the stations in 1984 and owned them until the late 80s. Farr recounts her years of owning WTIM and WEEE. I'd never been involved in radio at all. Uh, I had daycare centers and preschools that I had been involved with, and at that time I had moved to Taylorville had two great directors in both daycare centers I had. And so I was kind of hanging loose. I didn't really, you have to do, you know, be there every day. So anyhow, I had worked with my mom uh, at the World of Health and they had done some radio advertising and I had worked with it. And about that time, Dwayne Munson decided that he wanted to sell a radio station actually 70 percent interest in the radio station and so since i was kind of looking for something else to get involved with i thought well i would try that and i thought i'd do the management part of it and some sales and that's basically why i got involved in it well i really didn't think about being owner i was thinking more i was a learner and because i had a lot to learn and i had some good people around me Uh, that were able to teach me what I needed to know. Plus, I had some great salespeople that had been there for years. Uh, Gail Doyle had been there, and then there were others that had uh, been in the community and had, had done that work. So I also had people on the air, Danny Russell, and uh, at that time, I'm trying to think who he was on the air with, but he was, had been on the air for years, and so he kind of taught me the ropes of what it was like to run a board, and so I just came on and just tried to learn the best I could. They got to know me uh, being on air, because not too long after I started at uh, WTIM, and at that time it was WTJYFM too, uh, I went on the air with a cooking show, and so I thought that was a good way for me to get to know the listeners and for the listeners to know me so I would go on the air Monday through Friday 9 to 10 and talk about recipes we'd have callers call in and I'd always have a guest host too because number one it was a great way to get uh, advertising revenue because people wanted to come on the air and talk about their businesses so I had Dick Berry was on with me and then I Jordan Podeski from McCarty's, but it was Ray's Place at that time. And uh, then there was a Golden Corral in Taylorville. So there were several people that came in on the air from there. And then I would just have callers that were regulars 
and I bring them in on the air every once in a while. So it was fun. That was a good way to get to know the community, what they needed, what they wanted. And uh, then when I got out to do sales, then a lot of people had listened that morning to the radio show and usually listen us for some big goofs because they happened. And uh, they'd be saying, oh, I heard you this morning and what you said and laughed usually because it was uh, something that I messed up on most of the time. Well, we tried to do as much local uh, promotion as we could. We would take on different benefits. Um, and when we were, or when I was at the radio station, it was at the time when uh, they were deciding to shut down uh, Peabody number 10. And so we did a lot of work with, you know, the radio station and trying to encourage, you know, them not to shut the mine down. Uh, actually, a group of us went up to uh, Chicago, to Commonwealth Edison, and sat down with the directors to see if there was something that we could work out, you know, especially for people who were close to retirement. And basically, we got to uh, increase it three years, which was still, you know, <laughs> not enough, but it did help some people. Uh, we also at that time were doing the prison. We were trying to recruit for the prison to come into Taylorville because we knew the lost jobs we were going to have with uh, the coal mine. And uh, we did rallies for it and meetings and had uh, several rallies at the high school and then one big rally out at the Christian County Fairgrounds. To thank all the people that helped me during that, you know, those years and uh, I hired Matt McLemore, and I remember getting his tape, and I absolutely loved his voice because I thought he was had a comforting voice, but he had a smile in his voice, and I, that was something I always enjoyed a lot. The thing of it is, I had no radio experience, so I always thought my voice was kind of cackly and my laugh was kind of strange, but um, I thought, with his tape, when I saw it, or when I heard it, I thought he would be great, but he would live in California. And I thought, I'm not sure that he would want to come here, number one, or number two, if he did come here, he'd stay. I, because radio has a big turnover. And uh, I think what, he celebrated 25 years at WTIM. So he came and he stayed and he did a great job for lots of years. The stations were purchased from far by the late Jim Green of Springfield in the late 80s, and he owned WTIM AM 1410 until its present owner, Miller Communications Incorporated, purchased it in the fall of 1992. WEEE was sold to Midwest Family Broadcasting upon the FCC, granting a power increase for the station from 2200 to 25,000 watts in 1992 and was then co-located with WMAY AM 970 from their studios in Riverton, where it continues to operate from today. Miller Communications Incorporated, led by President Randall J. Miller, returned WTIM AM 1410 to its place as a respected local media outlet upon his arrival just after Labor Day of 1992. Miller managed the station that fall, then taking ownership on December 1, 1992, following FCC approval for the transfer of ownership. WTIM announcer Matt McLemore had been with the station about a year when Miller purchased the station. He recounts his memories of the transition and his part in WTIM's growth over his 25-year career at the station. Yeah, well, I was born in Decatur. My family was from Decatur and the surrounding areas so uh, I felt and I knew a lot of people around here I went to high school in Blue Mound so uh, I really wanted to get a job in this area so I was really concentrating Springfield Decatur you know so this was perfect for me well first I was the newsman that's how I got my foot in the door I didn't really want to be the newsman but I wanted to work at the station so and I, I knew how to do news so I, I did news I wrote stories interviewed people I did uh, several newscasts every morning but just to wake up 
here's some guy on the radio and he's talking about you. He's talking about your home. He's talking about your weather, your news. And that's, you know, something that people in Taylorville, <clears throat> you know, I think they really appreciated that. I always tried to have topics, but we also called it open line for a reason. So if people, I always said, if you want to talk about something else, feel free. But yeah, I would bring up things and I, would, I pretty got pretty good at knowing what would get some calls going and what people would be interested in hearing about and talking about. So it's on Friday, I would say I can't wait for Monday, you know. So I'm not kidding you, sometimes I just couldn't wait to do it. People called in and they were talking to somebody they knew and they were more comfortable doing that. And we'd kid around and, you know, I, I mean, we had a lot of fun on there. People, I remember a guy named Lloyd that used to call in. We had a lot of fun with Lloyd and, and Colleen. Uh, she used to call in. So yeah, we had a lot of, a lot of real characters. That was County Market and uh, I had great interaction with Sonny, Sonny Bertusi. And uh, yeah, so I still see Sonny once in a while and say hello. But yeah, we had a lot of fun. We talked, you know, a little bit about groceries, but a lot about other stuff. And, and he said he got a lot of people coming up to him and telling him about that. And so, and I did too, you know. That Sonny, he's really something, yeah. So, yeah, that was the start of a beautiful friendship. You know, what motivated me was they're dependent on me, you know. I mean, Randy's going to have to roll out of bed and go in for me if I can't, if I get sick or if I get drunk the night before or something. So uh, I always felt that was important and I, uh, to be there. And uh, I'm proud to say that in all those 25 years, I never, never was late. When you turn on the mic, you're talking to your best friend. Pretend you're talking to the very best friend you have. And that's what the listeners were to me was best friends. And you know, they, uh, they responded well, they called in. And if I would meet people, that I had no idea who they were. And they would say, Matt, Matt how are you? You know, so I knew that people were picking up on it. So I really enjoyed that. I thank God every day. I really do, every day I thank God for the job I had and for the family I built here and all the things that, uh, that it's meant for me. Thanks to the support of the Taylorville, Christian County, and Central Illinois communities, Miller Communications and WTIM experienced rapid growth in the 1990s, adding a 6,000-watt FM signal, WMKR 94.3, in 1996, moving WTIM from 1410 AM to 97.3 FM in 1997, Purchasing the former WXKO 100.9 FM in Pena in 1997, building what is now WSVZ 98.3 FM Shelbyville in 1997, selling WXKO in 2002, adding a classic hits format called Groovy 93.5 in 2011, and adding signals at 104.1 and 96.1 FM in that decade as well. WTIM's information format moved from 97.3 FM upon purchase of the Big 870 AM signal in August of 2014. Today, the WTIM family includes WTIM's information format on a host of platforms. The Big 870 across central Illinois, 96.1 FM in Christian County, 107.5 FM in Shelby County, and 107.9 FM in the Pena Nokomis area. WMKR remains at 94.3, changing format from light rock to mainstream country in 2002, covering a 40-mile radius. WRAN's classic hit format continues as Groovy 97.3, serving a 40-mile radius. And our Shelbyville station, WSVZ, cranks out 60s oldies to a 40-mile radius. WTIM has two other sister stations serving Christian County and surrounding area. The new Country 104.1 features a hot country music format. Miller Communications entered the digital world in 2005, when TaylorvilleDailyNews.com was launched, posting the same local news, police blotter, for the record, obituaries, and sports that are heard in local newscasts on its now six radio stations. TaylorvilleDailyNews.com doesn't have a paywall, so it's free to read. 
Over 50,000 users a month read TaylorvilleDailyNews.com in a 50-mile radius. WTIM provided key information to the community when an EF3 tornado hit the town December 1, 2018. Here's a video produced by WTIM that included audio from the night and days following the tornado. WTIM's extensive coverage earned the station the best spot radio coverage and best community service awards in small market radio in the state by the Illinois Broadcasters Association. A thunderstorm wind gust reported at 75 miles an hour hit Capitol Airport in Springfield, and of course that is in Sangamon County. 521 Fire Department and Rescue reported a tornado on the ground at Taylorville with multiple power flashes reported. Taylorville Fire Chief Mike Cruz asked to try and keep the streets clear as they are working out on the streets to help out anybody who's in need of help. Or uh, He did mention a few people have been reported as trapped in houses that were severely damaged by the tornado that rolled through. Uh, so that's the main thing right now is if you're in areas where this tornado has touched down, steer clear of the streets because emergency crews are working as fast as they possibly can to any of these severely damaged parts of where this tornado ran through. It is so important to stay out of those areas where there has been damage because you've got to let the first responders get into those areas and if there are any people trapped to get them out. And if you're listening to us right now, uh, please stay by your radio. That's the best place to be because uh, we have our crews are trying to get out of their particular homes and areas themselves. We've got two of our staff members that uh, can't get out because of various damage to buildings uh, that they live in. Uh, so we're trying to get to them, uh, number one, making sure they're safe, and number two, getting them uh, as part of our crew so that we can send one of our reporters over to the command center at Taylorville Fire Station to give you the latest information on what is going on, how many homes were hit, and if there are any people trapped and their conditions. You're listening to News Talk WTIM. Danny Russell on location here at the Taylorville Studios this morning, bringing you live coverage of the tornado and the aftermath and the cleanup as it gets going here throughout the day today. We're going to give you complete updates as we have available and information as we have it available here. Things are certainly progressing uh, rapidly this morning and uh, through the afternoon. Uh, the, the roads are opening up. At, at a rapid pace, uh, we're able to move equipment in and out much easier today than we were yesterday. As we close to congratulate WTIM on its 70th anniversary providing local radio to Taylorville, Christian County, and Central Illinois, watch the screen for the names of some of the people that have enabled WTIM to be on the air for the past 70 years. And to close the evening, here's the call of the varsity football game at Taylorville heard on WTIM October 14, 1994, when the Taylorville Tornadoes beat Sacred Heart Griffin 15-13. Terry Wright and the late Don Anderson have the call. But we need about a 15-yard pattern. Again, the lone setback is going to be Rapture north in the slot to the near side. Back to pass goes Odom. He's under a rush. He's going to get rid of it. Oh, he did the smart thing. He got rid of it. Boy, I don't know how he got rid of it. He was almost on his knees when he passed it. There's 10 seconds left. Now the down situation. It's going to be third, third down, down here. Yeah. Well, about two uh, two plays more, and that's going to be about it anyway. Yeah. Come on, let's get her in there, coach. Mike Flynn is coming in with the play. Come on, let's go. Let's 10 go seconds showing on the clock. If we complete it over the middle, you've got to call an immediate timeout. Yeah. Here we go on third down and 10 from the 35-yard line. Odom with the long count. Drops back. He wants to throw. He looks left. He's throwing it to the sideline to Milam. Oh, my God. He's out of bounds. 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 He's out of bounds.
is out of bounds, and here comes an opportunity to kick the game-winning field goal. What a finish it could be. What a finish this could be if they don't call a timeout, guys. Let's get set. Go timeout. Go timeout, coach. Sure, surely we've got the timeout call. Timeout. No. They're stopping the call. Griffin is going to take the timeout. Oh, here we go. Holy cow. Well, there's no way we're going to leave here with one second showing on the clock. I wasn't sure Milam was going to get out of bounds over there and stop the clock, guys. Yeah. Oh, man, what a pass play on a third and ten. We went all the way from the 35 down to the five-yard line. Got out of bounds. This is going to be nothing more, actually, than an extra point attempt, but those are certainly not cinches. And it, it's not from the middle of the field. It's from an angle, so it makes the it left a little pass. So from the five, add seven to the spot, ten of the end zone. We're looking at a 22-yard field goal attempt. The Taylorville fans are stunned. The Griffin fans, I think, are even more stunned on the far side. I don't think there's been one person leave this field tonight. It all comes down to this, fellas. A 22-yard field goal attempt from the left hash mark by Mike Flynn. All we can do is sit here and hope for a snap, a good hold, and a good kick. There's the snap, the placement, the kick is up. It's <laughs> Oh, they can't believe it! 